do this. They have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to see that people are keen, so that really, that's really wonderful. But see how far we get to. And if we can't do them all in one night, then we will, uh, of course, continue tomorrow, etc. Uh, but I promise, usually I promise, it's a dangerous promise to make, but I usually promise to get through all the questions at the very least by the end of the retreat. Uh, so even if we have to stay a day or two extra, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Uh, Okay, so um, uh, let's get started. Let's see what we have here today. Dear Ajahn, I once heard a secular Buddhist proclaim that the Buddha never said there is no self. Why do they uh, say this? Uh, if it, uh, and is it true? Why do they say this? And is it true? Thank you. Uh, a secular Buddhist proclaimed the Buddha never said there is no self. Uh, the way the Buddha talks about these things, he doesn't often talk about these things in quite such direct ways. And I think the reason for that is because he, remember the Buddha, he, uh, he, he came, his uh, background is the Brahmanical culture at that time. And the Brahmanical culture had a very strong idea of the self and the Brahman. Uh, the Brahman is like the absolute consciousness or the absolute self of the universe. And they had a very powerful belief in this. So the way the Buddha talks about non-self is slightly differently. Yeah. But one of the things that he, he says, uh, yeah, for example, one of the most famous suttas uh, where he talks about this issue is the uh, Anapalakana Sutta, uh, which is the characteristics of non-self. Uh, and then he says uh, basically that uh, uh, wherever, uh, whatever consciousness there is, uh, yeah, whatever, it goes through all the five khandhas, the five khandhas, uh, or the five aspects of personality, uh, this is basically what a person is all about. Uh, and he goes through them and he says, and, uh, especially about consciousness itself, uh, whatever consciousness there is, whether it's far or near, uh, uh, whether it is subtle or uh, gross, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, basically any, and towards the end he, he summarizes, whatever consciousness there is, uh, uh, none of that is a self, yeah, all of that is non-self. Uh, and that amounts to it saying that there is no self. It's a slightly roundabout way of saying it, uh, uh, but it amounts to the same thing. Yeah. The problem is that if you say that there is no self directly in a, in a, a culture where they are used to talking about things in a certain way, uh, very often it amounts to annihilationism. Uh, now the idea that there is no self, it means basically that when you die, you pass away, mm -hmm. and then that's the end of things, like a modern idea of materialism or whatever, physicalism, whatever you call it. Uh, so the problem is that you have to use a vocabulary that people can understand at that time. Uh, and then, uh, so dividing the person up into five aspects of personality, and then proclaiming that each one of those is mm -hmm. impermanent, non-self, uh, and suffering, mm -hmm. that is really how, how the Buddha expresses this. Uh, yeah, so this is what it really amounts to. Yeah. So, um, did the Buddha ever say there is no self? The Buddha, for example, very famously, in, in one of the suttas, there is a famous wanderer, and this wanderer called Vachagota, and he uh, asked the Buddha an enormous number of questions. Yeah. Yeah, he always comes to the Buddha and always bothers the Buddha, one question after the other. Yeah. And uh, it's astonishing how many suttas there is actually about this one person, this one man, this one Rimachagota. Obviously the Buddha must have seen some potential in this person. Uh, and in fact what happens is that eventually he does go forward, he becomes a monk uh, and he becomes an arahant. Uh, but there's a lot of steps before that where the Buddha has to kind of explain to him all kind of things. And one of the early suttas between the Buddha and Vachagota, uh, the Buddha asks the Buddha directly, Vachagota asks the Buddha directly, is there a self? Uh, and what does the Buddha say here? Uh, he remains quiet. Uh, he doesn't say anything yet. Then the, then the, the Russian God says, well, is there no self? Again, the uh, Buddha remains quiet. Uh, why is that? And then the Buddha explains why. Afterwards, Vashagota leaves. Then Ananda is still left behind because he is the, obviously the attendant of the Buddha. And uh, then Ananda asks the Buddha, well, why, why didn't you reply? You know. Uh, and the Buddha says, if I had said uh, that there is uh, uh, a self, uh, would I have been speaking in accordance with the reality and uh, what we know the reality is like? And the Master says, no, of course not. Uh, if I had said there is no self, uh, well then, Vachagota would have been completely confused. They would have understood what is going on. Uh, yeah. So this is the reply of the Buddha. And you can see uh, the reason why he replies to that in, in this way uh, is because of the cultural uh, 
a background that exists at that time makes it very difficult to answer these questions in a way where people actually understand what is going on there. And that's why often these things are phrased in a way which is not uh, too direct. Uh, and this particular sutta shows you pretty much uh, why it is phrased in this particular way. Uh, this microphone seems to be not 100%, but anyway, good enough there. Okay, so I hope that makes a sense, uh, kind of. Uh, and um, if uh, things I say do not make sense, and you have kind of doubts in my, my answer or whatever, you're more than welcome to come back later on and, and ask again. Okay. Dear Ajahn Bhavali, when doing the breath meditation, is it essential to observe all the qualities of the in-breath and out-breath? If so, how do you do this without having a conversation with yourself or start thinking during this analy analyzing uh, of the breath? Uh, thank you, Herr. Um, what you do is you do not start a conversation with yourself. Oh, the breath is long, it's short, now I see the end of the breath, the middle of the breath. Well, if you do that, you just very soon the breath will be gone anyway, because that's just the... <coughs> the nature of things, if you think too much. Uh, so please don't do that. Uh, that is not what this is about. It is not really about uh, you know, knowing particular aspects of the breath. Uh, we will have a look at the Anapanasati Sutta later on. Uh, and for those of you who know it, you know that the Buddha starts off by saying that we know the long breath uh, and we know the short breath. Uh, this does not mean that we're actually specifically looking for the length of the breath. That's not really what it means. Uh, what it means is that the natural progress of meditation usually is that when you are really relaxed and at ease, the breath is quite long. Yeah? And as the meditation develops, or sometimes often, the breath gets shorter as it develops further. Then you start experiencing the full breath. The next step after that is Sattvakaya Patisakvedi, which means to experience the, the whole body of the breath. Yeah? Yeah? And then you calm the breath down. down yeah? um, Kaya Sankara Patisambati or something like that is the last step of, of the four steps of the Anapanasati Sutta. So, uh, uh, but this process is not a process where you try to do one thing or the other. This is a process which happens automatically. Yeah? All you have to do is to be mindful. Yeah? All you have to do is stand back and allow the breath to be whatever it is. Uh, and as you do so, your awareness will expand all by itself. Uh, and when your awareness expands all by itself, you will see more parts of the breath. You don't have to worry about it, you don't have to think about it, you don't have to label it, you don't have to say anything about it. It just happens as a matter of course. Yeah? No verbalization whatsoever is required to do this. It's just a mental awareness. You know what is happening. So don't, please don't do anything. Don't try to make this happen. If you make it ha try to make it happen, it's very likely it won't happen at all. Your job is to just stand back, yeah? This is kind of the nice thing about mindfulness. Once it starts to gain a certain strength, it's like you are standing back from the world, not being involved in the world anymore. It's like a screen, and you just see what is happening. Yeah, it's very, very nice when that happens. And you will see it in here as well. You know, you, at the beginning of your meditation, you know, your noises may kind of, you may feel that they disturb you a little bit at the beginning. But after a while, it's almost as if you are withdrawing a little bit from the world. Uh, and the noises, what is happening around you, you can almost like to see it arising and passing away. It doesn't disturb you anymore. Uh, it doesn't have an effect on you. Uh. So make sure that if you, you know, in a room like this, if somebody starts to snore, yeah, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if I, <laughs> yeah, I actually find it, it's quite nice when somebody snores. It means that they're really relaxing, really enjoying, and kind of, at least they're relaxing, yeah, which is good. Uh. So don't allow any of these noises to disturb you. Uh. Don't feel upset if there is a, a you know, noise or whatever. Uh. This is just the nature of reality. There's always going to be some noises. Uh. People are just going to be people. Uh. And I remember what I said yesterday about that uh, when you are with a group of people like this, you're so fortunate uh, to be with a group of people like this uh, because these are people of the highest qualities. Uh. So remember that and just allow noises to come and go. Uh. And eventually your mind kind of withdraws from all of that and you start to see it with mindfulness and all you see is things kind of arising and passing away. That's all that happens. Uh, and it's exactly the same thing with the breath, yeah? You withdraw in a sense. Uh, you just allow things to be here. Uh, and the process is automatic. Yeah. So once you get the handle of this, once you get used to this, just sitting there, just waiting patient, not doing anything yet, yeah, it's actually very nice. Uh, yeah, it's very it's very uh, it's the, the will, it's nice to see that the will is such a, 
a painful thing actually about withdrawing the will and, and just allowing yourself to be rather than to do is actually very, uh, a very, very nice thing that happens. Uh. Okay. Okay, what happens to, to the 2 p.m. guided meditation? Okay, what happened to it is that I was taught uh, that it had changed from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. now. So that's, that's what I, I had, had heard, so I'm assuming that that is the case, so there must be, probably you have some, maybe old, maybe you have an old schedule or something, yeah. it's supposed to happen at 7 p.m. rather than 2 p.m. now. Yes, that's the new schedule now. So now we have 3.30, we have the uh, uh, Sutta uh, reading here. Yeah. And then we have the garden meditation in the evening here. Yeah. So okay, can we please do it? I, I prefer it to be like that if that's okay with you. Uh, if you really want a garden meditation at 2 p.m., uh, I don't know if I can really, uh, I think it's going to be too much for me, otherwise I will come leave this retreat completely, utterly uh, exhausted and I will end up, you know, that something bad will happen to me. Uh, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you're able to uh, fit in with that schedule now. Uh. Okay. Uh, if there is no self and no other, whom do we do the practice of loving-kindness for? Uh -huh. <laughs> if there is no, you don't have to do the loving-kindness for the self, yeah? You can do the loving-kindness just to beings. As long as there is a being, and beings suffer, and beings have good qualities and bad qualities, we can have loving-kindness for them. Yeah, loving-kindness for yourself. Remember, this is not about the, the pronoun, myself. There is always a there is a kind of, a, you know, a you in a conventional sense in terms of a, a stream of consciousness that carries on from one life to the next one. Uh, you are here right now, right? Uh, this is you. And uh, uh, whether there is an essential aspect to that you or not is kind of irrelevant. Uh, you are still here. You are still suffering. Uh, you still have good and bad qualities. Uh, so you can have loving kindness for that process. Uh, it's the process that you have loving kindness for. Uh, yeah, you don't have to have a self to have loving kindness. Uh, so, and you know that. Remember, the purpose here of loving kindness is not that it has to be directed towards anything specific. Yeah. The point of loving kindness on this path is to help you in your meditation practice, to purify your heart, to purify your mind, so you can end suffering. Yeah. This is the point of it. Yeah. And it's kind of irrelevant whether the self or not is kind of utterly irrelevant. As long as you are able to develop the loving kindness, that is what matters, uh, because that is what is going to take you towards awakening. It's a skillful means. Uh, it is not a uh, metaphysical statement about reality. Uh, yeah. So remember that. As long as it's possible to develop these things, uh, that is what matters. Uh. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahmali, in the Anapanasati Sutta, in the first exercises, the Buddha says we should breathe in and out experiencing the bodily formation. Then we should breathe in and out tranquilizing the bodily formation. How do we tranquilize the body? Thank you. Uh, sometimes you not you put your names on the end. I usually don't read out the names because it's kind of irrelevant. So uh, I hope you don't mind that. Uh, it does, this is not exactly right to what you're saying here. It doesn't say experiencing the uh, bodily formation. It says sabakaya padasangvedi, which means experiencing the entire body of the breath. Yeah, which means the, uh, in other words, you have an expanded awareness uh, and you are aware of the whole breath. That's what that means actually. Yeah. And in the last one, tranquilizing the bodily formation, that is correct. Uh, bodily formation here is a uh, a translation of, of a Kaya Sankara and the Kaya Sankara in the Sutta is actually defined as the breath itself. So what you are tranquilizing is not so much the body uh, as the actual breath. Uh, when you get to this point here, when you are kind of with the uh, breath and the breath is becoming peaceful and your uh, mindfulness has expanded uh, to encompass the whole breath, uh, your body is already fading into the background. Uh, what is left at this point is really just the breath, yeah? the, uh, uh, which is here called the bodily activity, I prefer to call it, rather than the bodily formation. I don't like this word formation, to me it means nothing. Formation is kind of weird, isn't it? But activity to me makes a lot of sense, because we all know what activity means. So bodily activity, and of course the breath is a bodily activity. So that is what we're calming down. 
But we're not actually, remember, you're not actually doing the calming down here. There's nothing that you have to do. What you have to do is step away from the whole process and allow it to happen by itself. Remember the Buddha says in the, uh, in the uh, dependent liberation sequence that this cannot be done by an act of will. If it cannot be done by an act of will, the will is not only is it redundant and unnecessary, it actually gets in the way. So you withdraw the will, and the more you're able to withdraw the will, the more the process happens automatically. So you just stay in the present moment, you just enjoy the experience of calming down, and if you kind of get into enjoying it, then that is actually the way the process starts to happen more quickly, because you're enjoying it, you're having a good time, and then the process is almost automatic as a consequence. So don't try to do too much. Don't try to make the meditation happen. Uh, the meditation happens by itself if you get out of the way, basically. Uh, you withdraw. You have to be patient. Uh, a little bit of nudging of the mind, perhaps, especially in the beginning. Uh, but there's almost nothing that you have to do. Uh. And sometimes you will find that the meditation is a bit like a, uh, you know, it's a bit, uh, it kind of has a natural, almost, uh, uh, it's a natural process, yeah, you start in the beginning, you kind of become more and more peaceful, and then you reach like a plateau. And when you get to that plateau, it doesn't go any deeper. It doesn't matter how long you sit, yeah, it kind of stops there, and then at some point you come out again. It's like a natural process that goes on there, and that's what meditation sometimes feels like. Not always, but sometimes it feels like that. And what is it that decides the plateau that you get to? What is it? You know, this plateau will vary depending on the day and all kinds of things. But our job is, in a, in a way, you can look at it as kind of uh, um, improving the level of that plateau, to bring it higher or deeper, if you like, so that you have more depth in a meditation practice. What is it that decides where the plateauing happens? And there's a number of things that decide that. It depends on the day, it depends on the defilements in the mind at a particular moment, and all of these kind of things, the conditioning how you feel, you know, all kind of things. But in the long term, what decides the plateau is your overall development of the Buddhist path, yeah? Your uh, ability to live well in daily life, especially, is going to decide where that meditation plateaus out. So uh, over time, not so much perhaps during a single retreat, but over, over time, uh, you will see that, that plateau actually changes. Uh, it becomes deeper, more profound. Uh, yeah, and this is a, a, one way of thinking about meditation practice. Uh, that's how you know, the, the body becomes more tranquil and, and the breath and all these kind of things. So. Okay. Uh, okay, sometimes in meditation, my legs are making involuntary jolting movements. Uh, are these bodily tensions being released? <coughs> Shall I just let them be? Uh, they are quite likely to be bodily tensions being released. Uh, yeah, people have all kinds of things happening in the meditation practice. Uh, legs and uh, involuntary jolting may be part of that. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, just allow it to be. Don't try to control it. Don't try to stop it. Uh, if uh, you know, as long as it doesn't kind of get violent or anything like that, uh, you're okay. You kind of leg shoots out and kind of hits your neck, and that's when you have to <laughs> control it a bit. But as long as that doesn't happen, you are fine. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So indeed, let it be. The, the, the thing is that you know, we are, uh, almost everyone has some little th little things that kind of we need to release, whether it's uh, psychological things or physical things or whatever, and the body will do all kind of, sometimes all kind of weird stuff, but a lot of the time it is just your perception. It's actually nothing is really happening. Uh, yeah, as a Brown told me the story, there was a lady apparently, she was uh, coming to her and said, oh, it's terrible, you know, whenever I meditate, my body is swinging all over the place. Uh, and as a Brown told her, no, you know, I looked at you, your body is swimming. Yes, my body is swinging. No, it's not, I, I, I've been watching you. My body is swinging. And I said, I said, okay, I'll get the video camera, I will point it to you, and I will take a video of you to show you that you're not swinging. Yeah? And then that kind of that lady came about. Maybe, maybe you have a point. The, pro so the point is that sometimes it feels so real. It feels like things are really happening. But actually, all it is is a mental construct. This is very, very common in meditation practice. So you will experience all kinds of weird things. Yeah, your body will do, do all kinds of stuff, expand, contract, float, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, 
uh, because of that, just allow those things to be. Don't worry about that. Uh, as long as your mental state is uh, positive, yeah, as long as you don't feel confused or angry or have some kind of powerful defilements in the mind, as long as your mind is in a good state, uh, that is what matters. Uh, that is really the thing that really is important. Not the perceptions you have, uh, that your mind is in a generally good state. Uh, so whether it's jolting in the legs or anything else, uh, uh, there's nothing really to worry about. Uh, Okay. Uh, okay, first, or what is the beginning of That's page number two, that's page number one. Uh, I'm glad there's not a page number three and four because. Uh, <laughs> okay, when faced with the questions about our existence that the Buddha did not answer, and perhaps the Abhidhamma not so successfully tries to answer, there is the story about the Buddha. Uh, that were holding leaves from the forest, exactly ground, in his hands, uh, and asking the monks where, uh, uh, where there are more leaves, in his hand or in the forest ground. Does this story mean that we get to know all about the leaves on the forest ground once we get enlightened? <laughs> You're really interested in those leaves, aren't you? <laughs> So, but this, this is kind of the problem. Those leaves are really interesting. I know exactly what you mean, actually. Yeah. I also think the same thing. Well, if the Buddha knew all this stuff, uh, how do we try to know about these things? Uh, and this is precisely the problem. Uh, yeah, the world is just so interesting. You know, sometimes you read about science, science magazines and like kind of, you know, astronomers kind of discovering things. And, and it actually is all quite, quite interesting sometimes to read about these things. Uh, and I think this is the problem. I think the problem is that the mind already has a tendency towards proliferating and thinking about things and being interested in all kinds of stuff. So the Buddha probably says that, well, I'm going to cut down the proliferation to an absolute minimum so that we don't actually get involved with stuff that argue is irrelevant to the path. We can imagine if, if the Buddha had kind of said all of these philosophical things and perhaps we wouldn't be able to understand it. Yeah, so because we didn't understand it, we would argue with the Buddha and we spend our rest of life arguing with the Buddha. You're talking nonsense. Everybody knows that that's not true. Yeah, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, quantum mechanics says this and you're saying that. Uh, so who is right? Well, we know that quantum mechanics is right, so you must be wrong. Yeah. And this is the problem uh, with philosophy. It is endless arguments, endless discussions. Uh, and it never really comes to, uh, there's no conclusion in, those, in that area of life very often. Uh, so this is why I think the Buddha does this, and this is why uh, we uh, stay as narrowly focused as we possibly can on the Buddhist path. Uh, that already is so much, there's so much to be discovered in the suttas, uh, there's so much to be uh, understood and reflected upon, and if you are able to focus on that, then actually it will be a tremendous advantage in our practice. Uh, do we get to know all these other things when we get enlightened? I don't think so, but yeah, not, not really. Not necessarily, because uh, these things is not what enlightenment is about. Uh, a way to know enlightenment is really just about overcoming suffering. It is to see the three characteristics of existence. Uh, understanding the five khandhas, the five aspects of personality, seeing them as empty, as non-self, etc. That is what awakening is about. It is about ending the defilements, ending rebirth. Uh, that's what you see. Uh, you don't come to understand the, you know, the and laws of the universe and how to unify gravity with quantum mechanics and come out with a, what, it, what, it, what do they call that? This law, the Tome law, T-O-E, Tome, yeah, theory of everything, yeah. Maybe when you become a Marahant, you can kind of advise the physicist on the theory of everything, that would be quantum. That would be, I'm not sure if that would be good or bad, probably would be bad actually, so please not do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So there you are, the leaves on the forest ground. It's a very famous symbol, and actually very beautiful. It's the Buddha, is in the Singsapa ground, and in the Singsapa ground he picks up the handful of leaves, uh, and he asks the, uh, the monks, what is more, the leaves in my hand, or all the leaves overhead in the trees? Uh, and the monks say, hmm, good question. Ah, actually, the ones overhead are much more. Uh, that's what the, what the monks say very dutifully here. Uh, so, and it's quite interesting in a sense, because obviously the leaves overhead in the canopy, it's not just a little bit more, it's massively more, it's like thousands of times more, yeah? So we're talking about, uh, you know, if, if that kind of reflects the relationship between what the Buddha knew and what he taught, then it's kind of uh, uh, quite uh, 
uh, astonishing, really, I suppose. Uh. Anyway, next question. Dear Adam, how do I maintain the focus on the breath for a long time without giving into thoughts? Uh, and this is a very good question. It's a, the two questions you get all, this is kind of the most common of all meditation questions, yeah? And, uh, and what you, uh, the, the thing here, the problem, there's a couple of problems. The first one is that people tend to go to the breath too quickly, yeah? It's when you start out your meditative breath. The breath is always kind of there, yeah, because the breath is part of our everyday experience. So, but you don't really pay much attention to it in the beginning. You don't place any focus on, on it. Uh, first of all, you keep your attention maybe on your body, on just enjoying the present moment, on fun, you know, feeling the place, uh, and uh, having a positive perception or whatever it is. And, and as you do so, you allow mindfulness to arise. Uh, one of the things that we will see when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta is that the Buddha says in there, having established mindfulness, then you watch the breath. Yeah, having established it. In other words, you do that first. You don't start watching the breath straight away. You wait and mindfulness is established. And uh, so this is kind of the, one of the critical things is that you do things in the right order. And if mindfulness is established first, then watching the breath is fairly automatic. Yeah. It happens pretty much by itself because uh, you already have that clarity there. You already have, have the awareness of the present moment. Uh, your thinking mind is already largely subsided. It uh, has yeah, not such a big problem anymore. Huh? So because of that. So if you get things in the right order, usually it will work. Yeah. But uh, the other reason why you start thinking uh, is because you're not really enjoying the meditation so much. Yeah. And the mind thinks, yeah, this breath is pretty boring, yeah, <laughs> nothing really too exciting, yeah. Anyway, of course, as soon as you think that, or even not even have to think, as soon as you feel that way, yeah, the mind is going to want to do something else, yeah. Think about the future, think about the past, fantasize about something, anything but watching the breath. That's the last thing you want to do sometimes. Yeah. So the trick then is to enjoy the breath. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha put such enormous emphasis on the joy and happiness of meditation practice. Uh, because this is the glue that uh, sticks you onto the breath. If the breath is joyful, uh, if the breath is happy, uh, that's all you want to hang out with. Uh, yeah, just you and your breath. Uh, you're kind of best mate in the world, yeah, you and your breath. Uh, it's a beautiful way of thinking about the breath. Yeah, as a friend uh, that you kind of walk together with on this path of meditation. Uh, so what you have to perceive the breath in a positive way. Uh, and as you do that, the meditation becomes very easy as a consequence. So the other thing that you uh, can do, and this is one of the things I was trying to mention on the first day, and this is the idea of knowing how to prioritize in the right way. If you have your priorities right, it's much easier to watch the breath. The reason we lose the breath, the reason we think about other things, is because we prioritize those other things. Yeah, what do people prioritize? They prioritize those thing, things that are important to them. Uh, what is important in your life? Uh, well, actually, instead of asking it that way, there's a much better way, and there's actually a way of finding that out directly. Yeah. There is, uh, you know, if you know that uh, uh, dependent origination, the tenth factor of dependent origination is bhava, which means existence. Uh, what does that bhava mean? Well, basically, it means that how you exist mentally right now in this life. Uh, so what, how do you find out where you exist mentally here? Yeah? And how, the way to find that out is basically just to sit back and watch your mind. Where does your mind hang out? Uh, what does your mind like to do? Uh? Yeah, so if the thoughts come back while you're watching the breath, uh, what kind of thoughts are they? Yeah? And it's very predictable what kind of thoughts they are. Uh, yeah, it's going to be about the things in your life that are important to you. Uh, family, uh, work, uh, yeah, pleasures in your life that you are interested in. Uh, yeah problems that you have had because you want to resolve them wherever they are in your life. Uh, these are the things where your mind is going to hang out. Uh, and sometimes the th thoughts are going to be very trivial. Sometimes people are just astonishing how trivial their thoughts are. Don't, don't be astonished about that at all because that's kind of natural. A lot of triviality going on in our minds. Uh, and the reason why the mind goes there is because this is what is important to you. Uh, this is what matters in your mind. Yeah? So what you have to do is you have to change your perception and you have to 
But basically remind yourself of what is important in life. Are these things important? Or is there something else which matters more? What is the priority? The more you get into the idea that uh, the spiritual life, the meditation, all of these things, uh, this is number one priority because this is where you find real meaning in life, uh, the easier it is to forget about your ordinary life, uh, see that as a support to your meditation rather than as an important in its own right. Uh, yeah, think about your family life as a support in a meditation practice. Uh, I have done that with my, my, my family in many ways. Uh, I, I realized fairly early on how important it is to kind of have a, you know, as good a relationship as I possibly can have with my parents and with my family. So I put a lot of emphasis into that. Uh, and of course it has a double benefit. Uh, one benefit is that it's very powerful support for your meditation practice. Uh, the second benefit is that you get an incredibly good relationship with your parents after a while. Uh, yeah, and I got both of those benefits. Uh, so it's really powerful. But the way I look at it from my perspective is that the priority for me is my spiritual life, uh, but uh, I then use my, you know, my ordinary things that I have to do to you know, support your parents or whatever. I use that in such a way that I, you see it as a support for my spiritual practice. Uh, and it has added benefit of also improving your relationship to the parents at the same time. It's a win-win-win situation, yeah? But even win-win-win, triple gender, win-win-win situation there. So very, very nice. So priorities is so significant. And to understand your priorities, you have to reflect a bit on the Dharma to see what really matters in life, what actually is in the end, what really is important. Okay, I hope that helps a little bit. But the overcoming thought is often a, uh, it can take time, but those are the basic principles that will get you there in the end. Dear Ajahn, the idea of vanishing completely uh, that is connected with Nibbana to, to me is quite scary. How can we deal with, or even better, get rid of the fear of extinction? Thank you. <laughs> How can I get rid of the fear of extinction? Okay, so what you do, this is what I kind of was getting at before, is you extinguish a little bit. I, I prefer extinguishment personally, but you extinguish yourself a little bit. And you look at that and think, wow, getting extinguished actually is really nice. Uh, yeah, you, if you, what, what is the thinking mind? And a very large part of the thinking mind is an expression of the ego. It's a sense of self expressing itself. Uh, you're talking to yourself, you're justifying yourself, or whatever it is, uh, all these kind of things. Uh, so when your thinking mind is dying down, uh, yeah, there's less ego in there. You aren't getting extinguished. Uh, so notice that. Uh, what does that feel like? Uh, feels really nice, yeah, getting extinguished actually is pretty good. Uh, yeah, you start to get kind of on the path to extinguishment when you understand that extinguishment is nice. Uh, this is how you get there. This is how you start to understand that this is a, is a marvelous thing. And then you extrapolate into the future. Uh, the deeper your meditation goes, uh, the less there is there of you, uh, the better it is, uh, the more happy you feel, uh, the more re sense of freedom you feel. Uh, one of the great things about meditation is a sense of release, of being liberated inside. Uh, you feel free. This is the weird thing. You're sitting there on the bottom, for the, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, you're doing absolutely nothing, but inside, uh, you feel a powerful sense of freedom. Uh, the less there is of you, uh, the more free you feel, the better it is. Uh, and this is how you start to understand why uh, being extinguished actually is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, the reason why we can't see it is because of the vested interest in the sense of self. Uh, the sense of self stops us from being able to see that. Uh, yeah, the sense of self wants to be reaffirmed. It wants to, uh, it, it, it want the sense of identity, you know, you, it's very hard to give that up uh, straight away. So yeah, that's why you do it in this way, gradually, and then, then you kind of gradually get around to it. Uh. So it's all about being skillful about uh, dealing with these profound concepts. Uh, and if you are skillful with it, uh, uh, then uh, you will find it actually very beautiful, yeah, very powerful. Uh, you start to understand that this actually is uh, uh, what life really is all about. Uh, the microphone is cutting out a little bit. I don't know if there's anything that can be done about that, but uh, anyway, just letting you know in case uh, someone has technical expertise in the microphone area. So, uh, okay. Dear Arjan, uh, considering that it is unlikely to reach awakening in this life, uh, 
Are there any means to raise the probability of getting into contact with the Dharma in the next life? Thank you, man. So you already think about the next life, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's a good question, though. You know, I, I, I appreciate that question because uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, and, and of course, one of the things I like to say is that every question has an answer in the Sutras. Every question has an answer. Well, not, not about quantum mechanics, maybe, but any question that ma- really matters in life uh, is answered in the suttas. Uh. And uh, what the Buddha says uh, is that if you want to come into contact with the Dhamma in a future life, uh, basically you have to understand the Dhamma as best as you can in this life. Uh. Yeah? So read the word of the Buddha, investigate it, reflect on it, bring it deeply inside in a deep sense. Uh, you have a good, profound understanding of it. Uh, then when the next life comes around, uh, you kind of, and, and somebody says, oh, read this, you know, read this sutta. You think, yeah, okay, we'll have a look at that. Wow, I recognize this. Uh, there's something familiar about this. Uh, you don't know exactly what it is because you probably don't remember your past life. Yeah, I don't know exactly why, but there's something familiar about this. Cheaper, uh, sort of, what is this? Uh, yeah, and so, you, so you are naturally drawn to <coughs> something uh, simply because you did it a lot in the past life. Uh, and uh, so the more uh, understanding you have of this teaching, and this is one of the reasons why I really recommend people to read the suttas, uh, because the suttas is, uh, uh, if anything is going to be available in your future life, whether you are reborn as a human or you are reborn as something else, uh, what is going to be available are these teachings of the Buddha, not the idiomatic, idiosyncratic teachings of individual people. Yeah, they're often very idiosyncratic. One, one monk will say one thing, another will say something else, and the lay person teacher will say a third thing, yeah, and it's very idiosyncratic, and it will all have disappeared by the time we get reborn. The one thing that is stable is the word of the Buddha. And this is another reason why it is very useful to study the word of the Buddha directly, rather than listening to too many other teachers. Yeah. And of course, you study the word, and then you practice at the same time, uh, the deeper you practice, uh, the more ability also you will have in recognizing what these teachings are in your future life. Uh, yeah, so this is how you, how you go about that, how you kind of maximize that opportunity also in the future. Uh. So, but really, it comes, a lot of it comes down to making the most out of your opportunity now. Uh, if you make it the most out of this opportunity, you will have the foundational work will be in place for you to a kind of start, have a head start in your, in your next life. Uh, Ideally, you will have no next life at all. Huh? You will be extinguished, as the previous one said. Huh? So are you ready for extinguishment? Huh? If you're not ready for it, just kind of go gradually, enjoy the path as it is. Huh? There's so much joy and happiness on the path. Huh? Often you don't even have to worry about extinguishment, because all the joy and happiness will keep you going anyway. Focus on that, first of all, yeah? And then see what happens, see where that takes you. If it leads to extinguishment, okay. If it doesn't, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. At least enjoy the joy and happiness on this path. Huh? Okay. Dear Ajahn, thank you for coming all the way to give this retreat. I was following the uh, forward from the BSW AGM. <laughs> okay, and the eventual reconciliation with some interest. Uh, what do you think are the important factors in conflict resolution? What are some lessons to be learned from this event? Uh, many thanks. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, what are the uh, uh, important factors in conflict resolution? And um, uh, it, it is, um, you know, I, th- I think one of the w- one of the things that we have at the BSWA, which obviously is very useful, we have a uh, in someone like Ajahn Brahm, who is very respected in the Buddhist community. Uh, so in the end, people would tend to defer to Ajahn Brahm, and this is very, very helpful in any kind of community here. Yeah. So to have a spiritual leader that everybody kind of respects to some extent uh, is actually very, very useful. Yeah. So if you can have that in your Buddhist community, whatever that is, uh, you know, someone who you can kind of can come to to ask for advice and kind of bring people together, that often helps. Uh. It doesn't always help. Uh. Yeah, even at the time of the Buddha, the monks were arguing, even when the Buddha said to them. Please don't argue. Yeah, this is the wrong way. It's not going to get you anywhere. 
you know what the monk said then? He said, oh yes, Lord, Buddha, yeah, we know, yeah, you just take it easy and go and meditate, we will sort this out. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they said, yeah? It's, it's you know, verging on the root, to say the least. And, of course, what did the Buddha do? He, you know, he left, basically, and he went off into the forest, stayed in the forest by himself for a while, and when the monks had kind of cooled down a little bit, then he came back and he, he gave some teachings afterwards. So you see, sometimes it is impossible. Yeah? Conflict is almost uh, inherent to the way people work because we have egos, we have senses of self and all these things. Uh, sometimes it's almost impossible to avoid conflict. Uh, so uh, to avoid a conflict, obviously, the, the first thing to do is to ensure that we, uh, you know, we uh, use right speech. Yeah, this is so important. Uh, even when you go on the internet, please try to use right speech on the internet. Uh, and you know, uh, there are real people out there. Sometimes people think that the internet is not really real people; it's just text on the screen. But not really. You're actually communicating with real people. So using right speech on the internet as well is very, very important. Obviously, yeah. So using right speech. Uh, using, you know, very often it's much better to let go of your own opinion and go with the majority sometimes. Uh, even if you think you're right, yeah? Let go of that sense of rightness. Who cares if you're right? Sometimes we don't even know. Yes, we think we are right, but maybe we're wrong. Yeah? It's just hard, so hard to know. Uh, and one of the beautiful teachings of Ajahn Brahm is that uh, there isn't any right or wrong solutions. Uh, there's only solutions with consequences or choices with consequences. Uh, so very often it's not so much about whether a choice is right or wrong, but what we make out of that choice. Uh, yeah? So you choose A or you choose B, one may be slightly better than the other one, but if we uh, if you take if you take choice B and we make a lot out of that and we kind of do it properly, it may be better than choosing choice A and executing it badly. Yeah? Yes, very often it's in the execution whether something actually becomes good or not. Uh, so very often, letting go of a little bit of ego, letting go of a sense of self, uh, is often a very beautiful way of uh, helping out with creating harmony. Yeah. Still, you know, I think one of the things that you find if you have committees, uh, the people who are attracted to committee work uh, are often people with strong opinions. Yeah? So you, kind of, you get a group of people with strong opinions together, that usually kind of leads to unfortunate consequences sometimes. Uh, um, uh, another thing, uh, very often that is useful, of course, and this is a standard idea as of conflict resolution. Sometimes you need to have a third party from outside uh, to help you out. Uh, yeah, it's okay in the Buddhist community to do that sometimes. Uh, the third party will come and sit down with you and say, okay, let's resolve these issues. Yeah, standard way of conflict resolution to help you win out. Uh, but the most important thing is to have just goodwill and a positive attitude. Uh, Remember that the people you work with in the Buddhist community are all, almost always people who are at root, they are well-intentioned. Yeah? They really want the best for that community and for everyone else. And if you remember that, if you remember the metta, the compassion, the goodwill, then usually you will find a solution to these things. But it's not, it's not easy, so there isn't, of course, there is no real final answer, unfortunately, to these kind of issues. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do monks and nuns get blissed out most of the times they meditate? Uh, when the monks and nuns, as soon as we close our eyes, bang, bliss arises. Yeah? <laughs> uh, so not not exactly. Yeah, it's not, it is, just because you wear brown robes does not actually mean that you bliss out all the time. It, otherwise, it would be too easy. All we have to do is kind of give you a brown robe, and you will bliss out as well. Then. <laughs> you want to try it? We have this, you have got any spare robes around you? You can check it out and see if it works. Uh, you can become an honorary monastic for a few days. Actually, you really are honorary monastics now, you know. Uh, when you're on the eight precepts, basically you are you are like monastics. Uh, yeah? Uh, because you are practicing pretty much the, all the main rules that we do as monastics. Uh, yeah? So, what happens? Uh, are you, do you get blissed out all the time when you close your eyes? No! Yeah? So that is exactly how it works also for monastics. So, so remember, you know, this is a path and everyone starts out on this path at very different uh, levels depending on what your thing is you developed in the past life and all of these things. So monastics are just as varied as lay people are. 
Some people are incredibly good meditators, yeah? Like Ajahn Brahm, he's just out of kind of the scale, the normal scale, he's kind of an outlier, he's one of these kind of uh, extraordinary people. Uh, he, uh, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll see what happens. I can maybe tell you some, some little stories later on, but some of the stories of Ajahn Brahm are kind of pretty remarkable. Anyway, so it varies a lot, yeah? Some people are very, very, maybe gifted is the wrong word, but more like they have built up the right qualities of the parts to, to enable them to meditate now. But other people come to Buddhism because they have a very strong confidence in these teachings, and, yeah, and they are driven by that, but, but the meditation may not be so profound yet. Uh, so they build it up over time. Uh, yeah? So it's a wide variety among monastics, just as there is a wide variety among lay people. Some lay people are much better meditators than monastics. Uh, yeah? Just because you're wearing brown robes doesn't mean you are a super duper meditator straight away here. Yeah? So uh, you know, never underestimate your fellow lay friends in, in the, you know, you lay, uh, lay men and lay women, because sometimes they can be very uh, wonderful people, wonderful spiritual qualities. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I hope you're not too disappointed with that. I hope that you're okay. <laughs> so, okay, how do I stop keeping uh, getting entangled in things? <laughs> how do I stop getting entangled in things? Okay, so this is uh, uh, obviously one of the big problems in life. We get entangled in stuff all the time. We get entangled in the world. And uh, the Buddha says, you know, after the Buddha's awakening, he looks around the world and he says, all these people, they're so entangled that I'm not going to teach them the Dhamma because they're too confused and too entangled. <laughs> that was what the Buddha thought <laughs> after his awakening. Yeah. So the, the way to stop getting entangled in things is gradual. It's not something that you can stop just like that. Yeah. Remember that the idea of attachment and craving in Buddhism is, is a natural expression of the sense of self. As long as you have a sense of self, you're going to attach to stuff. You're going to crave for things. You can't avoid that. Whenever I hear a Buddhist say, I'm, I want to be a good Buddhist, I should not attach, I think, forget about it. You can't, it can't be done like that. You can't decide not to attach. It is a natural expression of who you are as a person until you reach awakening. So really, the right way of getting entangled is just to practice the path. Uh, yeah? Increase your amount of kindness. Uh, increase the way uh, you think about people around you with more kindness, with more compassion, with more understanding. And that very fact that you're practicing the noble eightfold path, uh, you're being more kind as a person, that already decreases your entanglement. Uh, yeah? So this is the beginning of, of how this works. Uh. The second thing that you can do and this is, uh, uh, if you find yourself getting entangled, very often those entanglement are consequences of choices that you make. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly what you mean, whether you mean like relationships or what you're talking about here, but uh, very often ask yourself, whenever you're going to make a choice about anything, uh, yeah, when you are about to enter a new relationship or getting a new job or, or whatever it is, uh, ask yourself the simple question, which choice is going to make my spiritual life improve the more? Yeah, so if you are about to enter a new relationship with somebody, who is going to be supportive of your spiritual practice? Who is going to be a compatible partner in your life? Who is going to obstruct your spiritual practice? If you're going to get a new job, what job is suitable to help you with your spiritual practice? Not anything too stressful, yeah? Don't get into some, don't become a lawyer or something like that, yeah? Be, be, be kind of a gardener. A gardener is a good job, yeah? <laughs> if you're a gardener, you potter around the garden and, and find and have your own company so you don't have a boss who bosses you around, but you have own little gardening company, and you just make a living for yourself. And you hang out in the gardens, uh, yeah, you come here to the Peak District, lots of beautiful little gardens here, uh, and then you kind of enjoy yourself. Uh. But this is it. My point is just to make the point that, you know, too often we focus on uh, Things that are going to enhance our sense of self and our ego is going to make kind of, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, fulfill some kind of a silly dream, really, about what we think life is all about. But instead of thinking like that, uh, what is going to enhance your practice? What is going to increase your good spiritual qualities? What is going to reduce your bad spiritual qualities? Uh, where should I live? In London? Uh, 
or to put it down the monastery here. Yeah? yeah? I, I don't, I'm not saying anything bad about London. I kind of liked London, to be honest with you. It was very interesting. I was wandering around London a little bit with Venerable Chanda, and she had got us this oyster card, yeah? So London is my oyster. Yeah, traveling around <laughs> everywhere in London. And it's, it's a very fascinating city. You see all this kind of really people who are really out there who are kind of dressing and looking really weird, and, you, and it's kind of nice. It's very entertaining, yeah, You're traveling around it. But also, you look at people, they also look pretty stressed out, most of the people, most of the time. Uh, so, I'm not saying anything about, about, about London, but you know, uh, if you live at Bodhi Nala Monastery, it is just a little bit more peaceful than London. Uh, yeah, just a little bit. Uh, actually, the margin is quite wide. Uh. So, this is, this is how you make your choices in life. You ask yourself, what, how is my spiritual path supported the most? Uh, and this is actually how the Buddha recommends us to make decisions in the Sutta. So, yeah? Because why? Because this is the purpose of life. The purpose of life is to increase in wholesome qualities and decline in unwholesome qualities. And as you do that, eventually, guess where it takes you? It takes you to awakening. Yeah? Keep on doing that long enough, but you have no choice to get, to get awakened eventually. Yeah? So what was your question now? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is how gradually you get disentangled yourself gradually from things. Uh, make good choices uh, and just keep practicing kindness in, in the right way. This, anyway, are my suggestions. I'm sure there are other things as well that you can do, but that's a, a good start for you now. Okay, so here we have a little essay here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, uh, no doubt the Buddha is our principal teacher. However, to understand the meaning and expressions of the teachings, I think the importance of the Arya Sangha cannot be underestimated. Maybe the missing piece for so many of us, as you said, uh, meaning has to be interpreted. It is here that things go wrong. If we interpret only through our limited understanding and practice, whereas someone alive who has seen the Dhamma can provide insight and embody the teachings until we are well established enough to go directly to the Buddha's words, and even then, keep us on track, yeah. Uh, you stay around our teacher Ajahn Brahm many, many years. Uh, you, Ajahn, can hardly be uh, thought of as dim-witted. <laughs> okay, I, well, okay, well, whatever. So what is the chance for those of us who don't have such access to the noble teachers uh, for one reason or the other? Should we make finding such teachers a matter of urgency? Thank you. Um, what you, uh, you you have a very good point. It is sometimes it can be tricky to interpret the suttas in in the right way. But remember, it can also be tricky to know who are the noble teachers. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people who think that uh, people are Aryans and they say, "Oh, my teacher is an Aryan." Uh, and I look at that person and think, "There's no way that person is an Aryan." Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. So our perceptions of people are so different. Uh, yeah, it's so uncertain. Uh, so I would, for that reason, I would recommend you, please, listen to teachers who inspire you, who you think, as far as you can tell, have the right qualities. This is so important. This is how we decide whether somebody might be an area. Yeah, you can't tell how they might be an area, is to look at them and to see if they have the qualities of the noble ones. Yeah. <coughs> but at the same time, also read the suttas. Yeah. Yeah, because then you start to gain a degree of independence. Yeah? Read the suttas and listen to those people you think might be noble ones. And as you do that, you're using two pillars, the Sangha, as you say, on the one side, and the Buddha on the other side. And then that together with your own practice, starting to see things for yourself, is then going to build things up in the right way. So these days, it is not so hard to find people who can inspire you. Yeah, many of them will be available on the internet. Uh, and if uh, your particular teacher is not available, either, maybe you can uh, send a letter to the monastery, ask for some recordings or whatever, so you can listen to it. Uh, but these days, it is not that difficult to uh, get, uh, you know, get good teachings, because the world has become a very small place these days. Uh, yeah, quite easy to travel, not so expensive anymore to travel around the world. And also things just being available on the internet, even easier. Uh, I was hoping that one day we would be able to provide from our uh, Jama Grove Meditation Center in Perth, which is a very beautiful meditation center. Uh, it's really, really nice, really secluded, very peaceful, very good 
And if my facility is there, if you ever want to come on a meditation retreat, you burn that and you feel like that. I would really recommend that. It's very hard to get space, unfortunately. Yeah. But it's very nice to come down there at least, uh, you know, maybe once, uh, once, once in a while if you have the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, but you don't have to because this also is actually a very beautiful place right here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one thing I was hoping to do one day was to kind of uh, maybe get kind of those retreats and, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, have, have them live streamed or something so people can actually take part in the retreats uh, from their home or from their, another location. So that is kind of the things that we are looking at doing sometimes to kind of uh, increase the uh, availability of the tea things we have in Perth. Because spaces are so limited and a lot of people are disappointed, if you want to go on an Ajahn Brahm retreat, uh, you have to know how to type incredibly fast. If you don't know how to type incredibly fast, uh, already you cannot get on this retreat. Uh, yeah? So all the people who are over what is the age where you stop to be able to type really fast? 25, yeah? <laughs> if you're over 25, there's no chance of getting on the retreat because you can't type fast enough any longer. Yeah. So, but I, know, I know that there are many, you know, some of the older members of our Buddhist side, they're kind of in their 70s, you know, they have no chance of filling out this form in time. Right? So they get a younger family member to fill it out for them so they can get on the retreat. Then. That is what they have to do sometimes. That's how hard it is to get into these retreats. So. So that would be my uh, answer to you, uh, yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, and again, as I said before, if you don't have to my answer, you're always welcome to try again. Uh, dear Raja, what would be your recommendation when, uh, where, where, where to start reading the suttas? Uh, um, uh, start with suttas and commentary. Uh, just let the suttas speak for themselves uh, with metta. Um, I, I think a bit of commentary is uh, probably useful. Uh, yeah, and this is, this is in a sense why, this is what I feel is my job as a, a teacher in a sense. What I feel is my job is to kind of uh, help you to access the suttas. Uh, yeah, this is what I kind of say. I would like to help you access the word of the Buddha directly. That's kind of my, what I feel is my job. And if I can do that, then I feel I have helped you at least a little bit. And that is a wonderful thing as far as I'm concerned. So if you find that my kind of commentary is helpful, yeah, then already uh, you know that that is maybe where you should start. Yeah, because you already have some uh, experience with that. Uh, you can also try to read the suttas on your own. But what you will find is that if you read the suttas on your own, it will be a very different experience from when you actually listen to someone explain what they are. Both things are useful, yeah? So try both things, uh, and then see how that kind of, how that feels for you. Now. So, uh, but especially in the beginning, it is very useful to, uh, you know, to have a bit of comment. The way I started with reading the suttas uh, was when I went to Perth, uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm, in those days, he gave sutra readings in the monastery and, and he would explain them. And I was almost astonished how he brought various suttas together and he showed how it all ties together beautifully. Yeah, He did that very skillfully. He doesn't do that very much anymore. But back in the early 90s, when I was there, mid 90s, uh, he actually did that a lot. Uh, and he's very, he's actually quite knowledgeable about, about the suttas, uh, but uh, you don't always get to find that out because he, these days he is more about just creating a nice atmosphere by telling some nice stories and jokes, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, don't, please don't underestimate Adam Ram's stories. Uh, often they actually very have a lot of meaning to them. Uh, don't think, yeah, yeah, I've heard that story before. Uh, try to listen to it again. Uh, because if you can put into practice uh, many of these things that he teaches, the simple things, uh, yeah, if you can do that much in your life, actually, you're going to go a very long way on the Buddhist path. Uh, Anyway, that's how I started out, yes, yeah? so I started listening to Adam Brown, uh, understanding the suttas, uh, and then I started reading by myself, and then it wasn't too long before I started arguing with Adam Brown, uh, and that's when he started regretting teaching with the suttas in the first place. Uh, now, that's not, not, not true at all, of course, uh, he did not regret that, uh, but, uh, you know, we can see how that might uh, kind of possibly be the consequence, even though, of course, it is not the consequence. Uh. Okay, a couple of more, one more question maybe. Uh, no, we have to, we have to put in 9.30, so a few more questions here. 
Yeah, but when the Rajah Ramadan, as soon as referred to what Lord Buddha taught and helped various people to attend Nibbana, what is the role of the Tipitaka? Another text which goes into Buddhist philosophy in detail. Is this text accurate or should one concentrate mainly on the suttas? So the Tipitaka literally means the three baskets. Yeah? So these are the three collections of Buddhist scriptures. Uh, and uh, one of those uh, collections are, is the Sutta Pitaka, which is the suttas. Uh, another one is the Abhidhamma Pitaka. And the third one is the Vinaya Pitaka. These are the three collections. And uh, in those three collections, the first one I would just kind of put to one side is the Abhidhamma Pitaka. Yeah? So get back on out of the way, first of all. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the Vinaya Pitaka. And if I were a lay person, I wouldn't worry too much about the Vinaya Pitaka because it's all about how monastics, the rules of monastics, and how the Sangha functions, all this kind of thing. If you're interested, you're more than welcome to read it. In fact, I have been translating most of the Vinaya Pitaka myself. And of course, I would always recommend my own translations, right? <laughs> so if you're interested in reading the Vinaya Pitaka in a fairly modern translation, you will find my part of my translations online on the website called suttacentral.net, uh, which, which hosts all the suttas in modern translations. Uh, uh, and you find that there. But I wouldn't really recommend lay people to get into the Vinaya, because it is really for monastics. It's, it's there if you wish, but not so important. Then you have the Sutta Pitaka. The Sutta Pitaka is also a very large collection. All the books of the Sutta Pitaka is about, you know, it's, it's quite long. Uh, and within that Sutta Pitaka, there is five Nikayas, five collections. Uh, and I mentioned four of those already. Long discourses, mid discourses, connected discourses, and numerical discourses. Uh, and the last one is called the Kudaka Nikaya, which means the small collection. Now, the small collection is by far the biggest one. Eh? <laughs> this is one of those uh, weird things about Buddhism. I think it was called the small collection because it started out very small, and then it started to accumulate things. They're becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So in the Kudaka Nikaya, the majority of texts that we find there are far later than the other texts. They are not really texts that were spoken by the Buddha. The majority came uh, centuries after the Buddha. That's why. For the most part, you can forget about the Kudaka Nikaya. Some of the texts in there are interesting. Dhammapada is very nice. Sutta Nipata is quite nice. Uddana, Itributaka, Therigata, Theragata. Yeah, a small section of that. But the rest of it, you can really, really uh, just uh, forget about if you wish. And that kind of brings it down to a fairly uh, you know, accessible and doable uh, amount of texts that most people have a chance to uh, look at if they, if they wish. So that is the connection between the suttas I'm talking about and the Tipitaka as a whole. Okay, dear Ramana Ramana, you, you stated that a Buddha just comes about as some conditions were correct, like people were supporting the clergy. Okay, I, I, clergy, okay. I, I, I like the word monks better than clergy, but anyway, I don't really feel like clergy, to be honest with you, but uh, <laughs> anyway. So, uh, are you implying that the Jataka stories, which mention Lord Buddha's previous lives, are not supported by the Buddhist texts that you have come across? Sir? Now, so the Jatakas, the Jatakas is one, collect, one collection of texts found in the Kudaka Nikaya that I was just talking about. Uh, and the Jatakas mean birth stories of the Buddha, it talks about the past lives of the Buddha. Yeah, and in there you find a lot of very famous Jatakas. One of the most famous ones is called the Vesantara Jataka. Yeah, and if you travel around it in a, many uh, 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 Asian countries where Buddhism is, is uh, you know is very prominent, like Thailand or Sri Lanka or, or etc., you often find the Vesantara Jataka is often set put up as a play. Yeah, and they play the Vesantara and often have children involved and all these kind of things, and they play these things. Uh, but the moral of the Vesantara Jataka, a part of the story is that this is the Buddha in his past life, he gives up his wife and children. Yeah, this is part of the story. I, I don't know the story that well, but he gives them up. And he gives them up to this fairly nasty character, this fairly kind of dodgy Brahmin. Is that moral to do that? Give up your wife and children to some dodgy person? Doesn't sound like a Buddhist principle to me, it doesn't sound like kindness. And this is the problem with these Jataka stories. They are not all that Buddhist, basically. 
Many of them, they come from the common heritage of Indian culture. Uh, there are stories that were around in India at that time. Uh, they were given a bit of Buddhist wrapping, but the core of the teaching still doesn't really sound all that Buddhist. Uh, and this is the problem when the Jatakas is trying to realize that this can't possibly be real Buddhist teaching because actually often they are quite immoral to put it, you know, put it kind of a, uh, directly. And uh, so, uh, yes, most of these stories are not Buddhist stories. Uh, there were things that were retold, collected uh, uh, in the centuries after the Buddha passed away uh, and therefore don't really form part of the, uh, what we'd call the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, but what is interesting about the Jatakas is that there are also Jatakas that are canonical, that actually occur in the suttas. Uh, where the Buddha talks about his own past life, and this is actually where it is a real text, where the Buddha says, this is what happened to me in a past life, so and so. There is the famous Gatikara Sutta, found in the Majjhima where the Buddha talks about uh, uh, being a Brahmin in the past life, uh, and he comes to meet the previous Buddha Kasapa, and he kind of says some bad things about the Buddha Kasapa. He kind of, uh, uh, you know, it uh, sort of puts pay to the idea that the Buddha was on the Bodhisattva path because it denigrates the previous Buddha in that sutta. And there are a few suttas like that uh, where the, uh, the Buddha talks about his own past existences. Uh, and these are called, often called canonical Jatakas. Uh, and if you want to read a real Jataka story about the real Buddha's past lives, uh, this is where you fi find that. Uh, there is one a very interesting little Jataka story found in the Anguttara Nikaya, where the Buddha talks about being a wheel, a cartwright, uh, not a wheelwright. Uh, yeah, a wheelwright is someone who makes wheels. Yeah, that's what a wheelwright means. Uh, so uh, he was a wheelwright. And uh, what is interesting about this is that a wheelwright in ancient India is a very low profession. Yeah, you are at the very low, at the very bottom of the social hierarchy. Yeah. So here is the Buddha saying, well, you know, I was a wheelwright, I was a very humble person, but I was given this job for the king. The king said, please make me a new pair of wheels for my chariot. So he did that. He was obviously very clever at making wheels, but still, it is a very humble profession. And this is the kind of jataka that I have faith in, because it doesn't kind of elevate the Buddha to some kind of super duper status, yeah, where he's kind of... A, already in the past lives is already really awe-inspiring and amazing. Uh, but it's kind of humble, uh, yeah? And things that are humble, uh, that are ordinary, that are basic, uh, yeah? Where it doesn't sound like somebody has created some kind of story to elevate the Buddha, that I think is very likely to be true. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in there, yeah? Nobody would dare to create that kind of story about the Buddha. You'd be thrown out on the Sangha if you, if you did that. Uh, that's why there is some chance it might be authentic here. Okay. Um, question number two. This is really cheeky. Yeah? Many questions on the same piece of paper. But, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, number two. As Buddhists, we believe in rebirth. Next birth, we could be reborn as an animal, say. Therefore, it is considered special to be born as a human being and be able to learn, practice, and maybe obtain enlightenment in this birth. That is why we humans being born at this time are considered special. Do you disagree with this view? No, I agree with you. If you are reborn as a dog, it's not so good. Yeah, it's very sad. If you are reborn as a mosquito, even worse. You can imagine a mosquito has a pretty hard time understanding the Dharma. Yeah, you can, it's not, not easy. So definitely, much better to be reborn as a human being. I, I agree on that too. Okay. Uh, not so much a question, but a wish for a reminder about noble silence. Uh, some are having conversations around the house, and it would be so nice if they could uh, let it be. Okay, so that is just a nice reminder. Uh, so if you're able to not talk too much, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, and remember that what you do by keeping noble silence, you're supporting everyone yeah, in the practice, uh, you're supporting everyone, helping everyone out. Uh, and uh, so if you think about it in the right way, it's actually a wonderful thing to do, to be able to be quiet. And once you get into the habit of being quiet, it actually becomes quite beautiful. Uh, not talking to anyone, just doing your thing in the daily life. After a while, you don't want to talk to anyone anymore, uh, because it feels like a, an obstruction in your practice. It feels like something you, you're not actually interested in. 
sometimes it can be a bit awkward because we're so used to talking to each other and, and suddenly you don't talk to people you can feel a bit tense almost because you can't kind of express yourself the way you're used to and, but it doesn't take that long before you get used to it uh, and then actually you don't want to talk to anyone anymore yeah that's even that's when it really kind of starts working for you so thank you for that you're more than welcome to put little reminders in here if there are little problems that need to be resorted out in this way here. Okay, here I turn. How can you get rid of the need of finding a soulmate? Does he or she exist? Thank you. A soulmate, well that assumes the existence of a soul, yeah? Otherwise you can't have a soulmate. So what if there is no soul? That is how you get rid of that one, yeah? That's the end of the story. <laughs> So the Buddha, Buddha already sorted that out a long time ago. There, can, there cannot possibly be any soulmates. So, so it, it, the idea of a soulmate is just this idea of somebody you feel very compatible with. That's really all it is. And let's face it, there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, there is no, ultimately there cannot be a soulmate because we are always changing, always going from one thing to something else. Uh, so someone may be a soulmate today, tomorrow they won't be a soulmate anymore. Uh, this is the problem with soulmates, uh, yeah? That it is, it's not going to last. That is precisely the problem. Uh, so uh, if I were you, be realistic about this. Uh, you may find somebody who you are really happy with, uh, and one day you're going to be disappointed uh, because it's not going to work out the way you, uh, the way you thought. Uh, uh, and uh, the worst thing about it, if you find someone that you are really compatible with, you have a long life together, very happily uh, married or whatever it is, uh, and then you have to die. Yeah, then you have to give them up, and it's just as bad. So it's basically it's like a it's a, it's a you know lose lose kind of not not win win but lose lose. Yeah, either way you're going to lose out. Either you find some dodgy person that you somebody you don't really like and you kind of you hang in there you know for a few years because of whatever reason, and then uh, you know because you have to you know some people have to be in relationships they can't bear not to be in a relationship. And if you're one of those people, then often you have a relationship simply because you can't live on your own. Well, it's not very nice if you think about it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you find the right person and then it lasts, then you have to die. Yeah, you have to say goodbye. And that is when you find it very difficult to let go when you're on your deathbed. So remember these things. Yeah, the idea of a soulmate is just one of these worldly ideas, uh, which actually is nonsense. There is no such thing as a soulmate. It cannot, cannot possibly be. Because we are changing entities, always moving around. It means that there is no, uh, no permanence in these kind of issues. So, yeah, so, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't have relationships. You know, please have relationships. If, it, if they are good relationships, they may be supportive of your practice. It is not for me to tell you what you should be doing with your life. And I think, personally, I think monastic life is wonderful, but uh, it's not for everyone. And it's not for... Uh, you know, sometimes you have responsibilities and things you can't get out of. Uh, I would certainly recommend that there are some wonderful things about monastic life uh, that are very hard to get in lay life. Uh, and I'll be happy to talk about those later on if you're interested. Uh, uh, but uh, again, it is, uh, you know, it is up to you. You have to know what's going to work for you. Uh, but be realistic about uh, lay life. And be realistic about monastic life as well. Generally, just be realistic. Uh, and, and if you are, you will uh, understand what is possible and what isn't. Uh, okay, uh, dear Master Ramali, how do you develop non-attachment to loved ones? Uh, I'm very much attached to my parents and I know they will part one day. What can I do to lessen this suffering? Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, to reduce your suffering uh, is the very first thing to do is precisely to remember that they will pass one day. So you're already on the right track. Yeah, By that knowledge, by continuously reminding yourself that the people in your life are going to have to disappear, uh, that means that already your attachment is becoming less as a consequence. Uh, one of the suttas we're going to have a look at later on is called Themes. It's part of the sutta package I sent out. Uh, and one of the reflections in there is that everything dear and pleasing to me will depart one day, must become otherwise, uh, must, must change. So if you keep on reminding yourself of this all the time, it's going to have to change one day, realistically, with clarity, 
with a sense of profundity and depth, the use and the clarity you get in meditation, to uh, remember this, uh, you will start to detach automatically. Uh, yeah? So this is one way of doing this, just reminding yourself of this. Uh, the other way of doing this is to uh, find uh, a sense of uh, independence inside of yourself. That sense of independence inside of yourself uh, is built up uh, by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, the more you practice kindness to the world around you, the more you practice kindness to your parents. The weird thing is that that actually leads to detachment ultimately. Uh, yeah, the more kind you are to your parents, actually, the more detached you eventually you will be. Uh, so by living your life well, towards your parents, towards everyone else, uh, actually detachment happens as a consequence. Uh, you're starting to build up happiness inside of yourself. You become more independent. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the Buddhist path, which is often underestimated, uh, is the fact that it leads to a greater degree of independence. Uh, you become a more independent person. Uh, does everyone want to be independent? Is that a wonderful thing to be independent in this world? Uh, instead of relying on unreliable things. It's bad news to rely on unreliable things, but that is, that is the nature of the world. The vast majority of people rely on unreliable things. And that is why we suffer so much. By being independent, you can withdraw that. This is one of the great uh, things that come out of the spiritual practice, uh, a much greater degree of independence. Uh, this is really all you have to do, yeah? Reflect a little bit in the right way and just keep on practicing the right things and then you'll be on the right track. Yeah? Okay, just uh, maybe one or two more questions. I almost got to the bottom of the pile and I'm very, very, uh, that's very good, I think, yeah? Because often there are more questions than later on. So when I get into a routine, daily meditation, I have bad dreams, nightmares when I sleep. Okay, so when you get into meditation, you have bad dreams. Okay, so maybe what you need to do is do the right kind of meditation. Yeah, maybe you're doing something which makes you tense, or uh, somehow it, it gives you access to something negative in your mind. I'm not sure exactly what you are doing there. Somehow you're getting access to content in your mind that is, uh, uh, you know, making things uh, bad for you. So. Do a type of meditation which leads to something positive instead. And of course the Buddha specifically recommends the metta meditation. If you do the metta meditation before you go to sleep, basically usually you will sleep very well if you can make it work for you. So find that if you have a hard time doing the metta meditation on your own, get a nice guided meditation that gives, puts you in the right mood, leads you on the right track, and then see if you can make it work, work for yourself. And if you get it right, I can guarantee you, you will sleep incredibly soundly. You will wake up in the morning re-energized, reinvigorated, yeah? And so many good things come out of well-practiced meta meditation. So try that, and hopefully that should um, put an end to your nightmares and problems. So. I heard that jhana can only be, only be taught to monastics. Is this true? No. <laughs> This is the shortest answer today. No, it is not true. Can we talk to anyone? Yeah? It is part of the noble level path. Anyone can practice that. There were lay people at the time of the Buddha who practiced jhanas, who became stream anchors, who became anagamis. Uh, there are lay people today who attain some of these things, certainly the jhanas. Uh, so it can be taught to anyone, it can be practiced by anyone. If the refuge is to be taken in the Sangha, how should one? Uh, look at the Sangha's decision against Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> uh, remember the Sangha here is the noble, the Aryan Sangha. It is those people in the Sangha who practice in the right way to do the right thing. And that is where you take refuge. You don't take refuge necessarily in individual people. Actually, you take refuge in the Sangha, the Sri Ratana is the Arya Sangha. We take refuge in the Sangha as a whole, but it's the Sangha as a whole as an institution. The Sangha that, uh, that uh, made a decision against Ajahn Brahm is just a tiny part of the Sangha. It's just the one platform is like a tiny little fraction of a very large institution. Yeah? So it is not, and even within that Sangha, it's only a few people really kind of, you know, who were upset about what Ajahn Brahm did. So uh, 
you know, don't worry too much about that. This is just the nature of the world. Yeah, disagreements happen, things happen. Uh, the vast majority of monks that I know that are in the Wampa Pong Sangha are very good monks. Uh, and they probably would support Adam Ram if they had the opportunity to do so. But uh, sometimes it's difficult because of politics, because of all kinds of stuff, but it makes it harder. So uh, don't judge any of those monks. Uh, if I were you, I would, I would you know, not worry too, too much about it. Uh, it is just the nature of things that things sometimes split up in this way. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, if you ask me about the whole split that happened as Ram was kind of thrown out of one pong, uh, you know what I think? Uh, I think it was a good thing. Uh, yeah, that's what I think. Because why it is good? Because uh, it is good because uh, it is not how Buddhism is supposed to work that we are part of some kind of little network where we're trying to control each other. Uh, yeah, this is not how the Vinaya works. Uh, the way the Vinaya works that each monastery is independent in its decision making. Uh, so actually being thrown out of that means that we have gained more independence than putting on a monastery. Uh, it's actually a good thing. Uh, and now we can do things more in accordance with the Vinaya. So from my point of view, it is not a bad thing at all. If we were invited to go back again, would we go back again? I don't know, I, maybe Adam Brown would want to go back for all time's sake, I'm not sure, but personally, I'm not particularly keen on going back, because I think this is a more, not because I have anything against those monks or anything like that, but simply because I think it is a better way of living the monastic life. That is really all that. So don't make any judgments. Yeah, look at the individuals. You find many inspiring individuals everywhere. Now. And then uh, you can take refuge in the Sangha as an idea, the whole Sangha, everything. That is the right way of thinking about it. OK, the last question for tonight. Dear Ajahn, if the Buddha explicitly references the 37 factors of Awakening, including the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, isn't it taking something away from the teaching if it is uh, 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 substituted under the Noble Eightfold Path? Uh, surely the Buddha felt it necessary to mention the 37 factor as important. Uh, just wondering. Uh, um, I think the reason why the Buddha uses the 37 aids to awaken the Bodhipatya Dhamma is uh, is to uh, draw out more of the whole scope of what the Noble Eightful Path is about. Uh, yeah? It's showing the various aspects of this path. Uh. So it is really to, uh, to kind of you know, make sure that we don't kind of misunderstand what the practice is about. Uh, he brings all of these factors in there. So I think whether you have a point, yeah? because otherwise the Buddha wouldn't have said it in this way. Yeah? But I think also ultimately it does also ultimately it does actually contract into the noble eightfold path as well. Huh? But of course the Buddha said this precisely to ensure that we don't misunderstand what that means. Uh, uh, to uh, we don't forget about all these factors and uh, what they mean in different contexts and all of these kind of things. Uh, so I think both are true. It is true what you're saying, uh, but it is also true that it does in the end contract into the noble eightfold path. Uh, so uh, yeah. Very good. Uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, and um, I'm very glad that you have some other questions. Now we can make some a bit good double discussions about these things. Uh, and uh, hopefully it is not too tiring for you. Uh, please remember that uh, it is completely uh, voluntary. You don't have to come to any of these things. Uh, and if you do get tired on the way and you think you've heard enough questions, you're always welcome to leave. Yeah? There's no obligation to sit in here for, you know, throughout the whole hour or hour and 15 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, so just for to be aware of that, there's no, absolutely no obligation whatsoever. I'm not going to put a black mark against your name. I don't even know the names of you and most of you anyway. Yes, I, can't, I couldn't even do it even if I wanted to. So you can kind of sneak out, put your sunglasses on and sneak out. And <laughs> <laughs> you'll be all right. But that is all for tonight. So I wish you all a good night. May you rest well. May you do the best you can to sleep. Yeah?